My name is David Mobley, and uh, what's this event we're at? Uh, Bob Ward is, is sponsoring a manufacturer's day uh, to allow the public and to come out and shoot different firearms. So more yeah, it's a great opportunity to get a bunch of different line. things you never the were able to shoot. Line. And uh, maybe then, you know, go in and buy what firearm you really like. That's right. Uh, what's your name and what do you do? I'm Paul Miner. I'm the president of the uh, Western Fishing yeah. Game Association. And that's the association that owns the Deer Creek Shooting Center. Oh, yes. And that's where we're at, Deer Creek Shooting Center. Beautiful place to be out in the woods uh, doing some nice recreational shooting. <laughs> okay, I got a few questions I want to ask you, Paul. Okay. And I know you're kind of itchy about doing some of these, so. We'll just get them done. Okay. Uh, what do you feel is uniquely positive about the firearms? Firearms within themselves are a, a fun product. Uh, it's fun to go shooting at uh, targets at tin, tin cans. Of course, we have the hunting industry. Uh, there are many, many sports that are involved with firearms. I'm also the president of Big Sky Practical Shooting Club. Nice. And we're involved with practical shooting. And that's just simply shooting at targets, paper targets, steel targets. We have uh, husbands and wives. We have uh, fathers and children and grandfathers and grandkids. We have a good family. Very good. Okay. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on the possible repeal of the assault weapons ban? I think it's coming up in September. Right? I believe it's September 14th, and I hope that it goes away forever and ever and ever. Yeah, I think it's kind of biased against normal people who are just good people. It, it's really not going to help the, you know, criminals are going to get what they're going to get anyway. Criminals will get what they want. Law-abiding citizens have been penalized right. with the ban. For doing nothing. For doing nothing. We're not the bad guys. Yeah, they're yeah. trying to hurt the criminals, and they're actually hurting the they, good they guys. They hurt the good guys. Yeah, so yeah, it's kind of a sad are. thing, like you said, that should yeah. go away, we think. Um, do you have any uh, final comments about uh, this shooting industry, um, yourself, uh, or about anything for the MCAT viewers at home? Well, this event that Bob Ward sponsored, uh, I think was very successful. We got a lot of people, a lot of people that didn't know about our range, and uh, brought out a lot of folks that were interested in shooting different firearms, and I think it went well. And I. I have a hunch they might be doing it again next year. Yeah, this is so. the first time for it, right? Yes, it is. This yeah. is the first time. So I hope they do it next year because I really loved it. Yes. Um, and uh, next time, probably have more people out here, more types of firearms. I would than you suspect there be more and, vendors, more. Yeah. Yes. More so I think it'll be good for everyone and lo loads of fun. Yeah. Literally, yes. lock and loads of fun. So, uh, anything else you want to say before we it, sign it's, off? It's been a fun day and, and thanks for. Uh, you, you being out and seeing some of the folks and seeing what's going on. Yeah, I hope this makes more of a positive side for the firearms industry because they've been put down so much uh, by various entities and stuff like that. I think we do need a positive side to come out for a change. Absolutely. So let's see if we can do this for MCAT TV. I'm David Mobley and this is uh, Paul, Paul Miner. Paul Miner. Yep. Thank good you. to meet you and yeah. thanks for doing the interview sure. for me and have a good day. Okay. Grab it like this. Like this right there. That's strong. Wrap the hand around. Yeah. 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 Dry fire. Yeah. 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 Yeah, all the way to the rear and hold it. Might a lot of people. Nobody's just got out of shipping. You eat it because I got $20 hand. Now relax your finger one-eighth of an inch. Tell you I'll eat it. I was looking at some other stuff for... Uh, so uh, some, some ball stuff for my uh, See the difference? smaller caliber. Well, you like to Fifty-two fly bucks away. for eight pounds. I'll let you decide how but you, you got to put freight well, and hazmat on. So you got to order it. Which I suggested. Yeah. Take it away. Makes it harder to shoot. Okay. We're not shooting that. You can look at that new outfit. What is DA? Be curious to see.
vigorously put the most of them to go UPS. Yeah. Well, there's, there's that new one that's supposed to be national, so it'll be interesting. Later. The original, still the best. The important thing is, <laughs> safety is disengaged when you pull the trigger. So it's important, unless you're on target and you need to shoot, always keep the finger right here. When you can't put the finger on the trigger, that means you intend the gun to go. Okay? If you hear me say trigger, that means check where your finger is at. Okay, to operate the side on the Glock pistol, you put the mag in the Bullet's pointing away, you reach up here, pull on that like that, now it's ready to shoot. Of course, we haven't loaded it yet. But, when you press the trigger, okay, gun goes bang, it does that by itself, by the way. Watch my finger, it's only going to go this far. See how little I move it? Did you hear the click? When you hear the click, shoot again. Any questions? Hey, come up. Okay, let's do this again. Yeah, they they will stop. Here. Go all the way down in your hand. Swoosh in there. Okay, fingers underneath. Now do it up there. This foot forward a little bit. Okay, tight into your shoulder. Okay, the other hand, you're shooting absolutely. Ready? Yeah. Go get it. There you go. Like that. Very good. Go ahead and stick your hand down. That's a very good thing. What I want you to do is have good posture, up straight, bring your left foot forward on the foot. Bend forward, squat. Bend forward, shoulders forward. I want you to support the See how that is? Relax, drop down, take a breath. Okay, at this time, go ahead and insert it into the gun. Good click. Now grab it like this. Yeah. Your hand. Make your hand look like mine, but a mirror shot. Yank it like a Not really. No, no, no. <laughs> well, let, me, back here. let me check with the other guy. I'll come back and do it. Okay. Finger off the trigger. Okay, grab the fan around in front. Bring it up a little more. Come out of Oregon, this is part of my area. Great. 
Thank you, Art. Dave Mulvick. Good to meet you. Appreciate your help. And the Remington's are much shorter, so they can't use the 2.8 inch mag well for the windshield. And the Remington, I understand. For that. I don't know all, you know, they're not telling me that, but that's what I'm from just looking at inches. I'm hoping they'll have some good caliber. I'm hoping there'll be some good 20 round, 300 super short mag mags out so I can buy them too. Yeah. How was that, Luke? Uh, good. <laughs> Sweet. Smooth shooting. You want something nice and fun to shoot? Yeah. Alright, that'll work. Let's see. Hold on. There we go. Sweet round. Wow. The far right hand side was nothing round but a big patch of red rust. That was a nice big red uh, or a nice I saw that one. Got that on camera. It's official. Luke can hit something. Kimber! I haven't seen any. We have uh, there was one, ten bars. And then the Kimber guy. Hi. Hey, is there any more 22? Oh, Scott Gibbs. Scott, hey, Colby. Nice to meet you, Dave. Right on. Doing this for public access. Cool. Absolutely. Are you familiar with the next one? Yeah. 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 We're running over in your car beating up. Why don't you help me out over there at the Smith Yeah, 42 shells. Why? Hey, look. Hit those pipes. Three. They're all Got one. It's ten million around. What's that? Timber time, that's a good way to end. High quality. What is this about again? Uh, part of the donations go to the Ronald McDonald House, um, and the other part of it goes to the Elk Foundation for the new facility that they're building. Okay. Let's flip that brochure over and see what's on the other side. Yeah. This, is, this is to help um, families that have their uh, their their children in the hospital and they need uh, surgery. Uh, what it does is it, it it provides a place for them to stay when they don't have the, the funds to um, stay in a hotel, especially if they're out of town. So it's a really good thing that we bring this to Missoula. The rules of the Deer Creek Shooting Range. Luke being funny. <laughs> of course, lots of people do that responsibly, so it's, yeah, it's got a bad rap. Although I don't even drink anymore, so I don't even know what I'm talking about. So. You have to have them on tripods if you have a fully automatic. Sounds good.
We're here at the 2004 gun show in Missoula, Montana at the Adams Center. Why don't we go in and see what's going on? Now we're going to speak here with uh, Gary Marbit, who's got a new book out here. Um, as you can see right there, Gun Laws of Montana. How you doing today, Gary? I'm doing great. Good deal. Um, I got a few questions for you, and if you have any comments or anything you want to say, make sure and pipe up at any time. Um, what do you think is positive about today's gun culture? Well, the gun culture goes back a long ways in Montana. Um, probably started with Lewis and Clark when they came through here with literally boatloads of guns and has been pretty consistent ever since that throughout the growth of Montana. Guns are an important part of our life, our way of life here in Montana. Uh, for example, Montana has the highest percentage of its population that purchase hunting licenses of any state in the Union. Um, we also, uh, there are lots of competition shooting going on around Montana. There's bullseye and silhouette and, and uh, small bore and trap and skeet and high power and, and action pistol and cowboy action and pr practical shooting and lots of other shooting disciplines going on. So a lot of people have guns for those reasons. Uh, certainly there are collectors and you'll see people here at the gun show who like these old guns, the antique guns and people make quite an investment in those and sometimes um, purchase them just for their investment value uh, instead of buying shares of stock in AT&T or whatever. Uh, but there are also a lot of people in Montana who have firearms for personal protection and that's a part of our way of life. Uh, we're an independent, self-reliant people in Montana and uh, it's certainly a, a, a predictable part of that that people would have firearms suitable for personal protection because police can't always be there when you need to protect yourself. No doubt, I agree wholeheartedly on that. Um, what do you think about the assault weapons ban being grandfathered out here uh, in September, I think, mid-September? Well, that ban was originally passed in 1994 and banned uh, certain kinds of semi-automatic firearms based on cosmetic features only. That is, do they have a carrying handle, do they have a, a telescoping stock, etc. And that ban has turned out to be particularly ineffective in its promised um, result of having a beneficial impact on crime. Very few crimes are actually committed with those kinds of firearms and uh, there just hasn't been any benefits. So um, that ban was passed for a total of 10 years in 1994 and will expire in mid-September. And I think it's likely that it will expire. There are certainly those in Congress who would like to reenact it and make it permanent. But I don't believe they have the political muscle to make that happen between now and the time that it's scheduled to expire in mid-September. And I think the expiration of that law will make Montana people happy because a lot of people uh, don't think that uh, there's any good reason uh, to ban those kinds of guns based on a few cosmetic features. Right, that sounds really good. Um, do you have any special interests outside the gun culture? Well, Montanans typically, uh, just about all Montanans are part of the gun culture. We estimate, uh, by we I say the Montana Shooting Sports Association, of which I'm president, uh, estimates that between 90 and 95 percent of the households in Montana contain firearms. So that's pretty much all of us. And certainly all of us who have guns have other interests. Those of us who go hunting in the fall um, may go canoeing or kayaking in the summer and skiing in the winter. We're all working people. Uh, we hold down jobs. We work at the grocery stores and the, the, the banks and the you know the other places of employment all throughout Montana um, a lot of a lot of gun owners in the agricultural community so uh, um, certainly uh, being a part of the gun culture although it's an important part of many people's lives it's uh, it's only a part of what uh, what we're all about here in Montana yeah so there's uh, definitely a positive side to this we're not all gun nuts as you can see here we're we're just normal people uh, the elderly, the young, the middle-aged, you know, we've got families and everything, so um, there is a bigger side, there's a bigger part of the iceberg here that's not just guns, 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 although we have a special interest in that area. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, could you share any stories about firearms saving, saving lives? Well, I do know that it happens. Um, I think it happens nationwide a lot more than it happens in Montana. I teach personal protection classes to equip people to safely possess firearms for personal protection. And uh, 
because Montanans own so many guns and are so prepared to protect themselves, we actually have less predatory crime in Montana than there is other places. And so merely the fact that we have this extensive gun culture in Montana is beneficial to everybody because there's just less predatory crime. And I do know that it is, it is most common that if a person is protecting themselves from some kind of assault, the mere display of a firearm is usually enough to do the trick. And it, it is pretty uncommon for a person to have to actually discharge a firearm um, to protect themselves, especially in Montana, mostly because the people of Montana are by and large prepared to deal with that sort of eventuality. Um, well, we're kind of at the end here. Do you have any final comments for the viewers of MCAT? Um, you ought to come out to the gun show sometime, see what it's all about. If you haven't, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Um, also, I should probably uh, mention that I'm a candidate for the Montana Legislature. Very nice. I uh, wish you all the luck in that. Okay, Gary, uh, my name is David Mobley. I uh, hope you enjoyed the gun show, and I enjoyed talking with you. And uh, hope you have a good day. We're here with uh, Everett LaJoy. And we're going to speak about uh, some of the gun culture and some of what he's uh, selling here, what he's doing uh, to enhance this gun show here in Missoula, Montana. Um, so how's it going today, Everett? Oh, going fine. We're enjoying ourselves out here at the gun show. There's a lot of antiques, too, and, and not just uh, gun or gun-related items. So. Okay. Um, so we'll ask a little bit about those. and. Uh, mostly about the gun culture is what I was trying to focus on, the positive side of it. So uh, let's get to some questions about that. Uh, what is the positive side, do you think, about today's gun culture? Well, there's a lot of people that have uh, been uh, educated with the idea that uh, guns are bad or whatever, and uh, they're definitely not. That's part of our heritage. Uh, it's also um, you know, part of our uh, constitutional rights from the standpoint of the Second Amendment authorizes uh, the uh, people to own weapons themselves and the whole idea Thomas Jefferson and some others had was to uh, make sure that the public had the right to protect themselves against a government that was a, a tyrannical form of government like uh, King George was and uh, so that's part of our heritage and something that we should protect uh, for our future and make sure that we have a country that exists for another 200 plus years. Um, the people who uh, own guns now are a wide variety of, of people. Uh, a lot of people do it for hunting, for just shooting, for practice, for just for fun. Uh, and that's gone on for centuries. In Germany they used to do it in the evening social events. They'd have parlor guns that would shoot inside the house to Oh, wow. uh, low caliber just for target practice see who was the best shot and things like our BB guns and yeah. stuff like that yeah they were uh, shot something similar to a BB gun but it was more like a 22 but a lot smaller caliber wow. but um, any rate uh, you know we've got all kinds of people uh, kids are learning how to to shoot and handle guns safely uh, I, uh, most of my friends and relatives grew up with guns in the household and Nobody ever used a gun wrongly, and I think if uh, children are educated uh, with the, how to handle guns, use them, then uh, and to be safe with them, within well, the, they'll grow up in a house with guns without any problem at all. And they'll be your future hunters and and uh, shooters, marksmen, and you see in Olympic events, you know they they have uh, people that are. Uh, good shots and a lot of them come from the United States That's right. Yeah, the media tends to focus on all the negative stuff So you don't see all the positive stories of hundreds of thousands of people who own and have guns and use them responsibly um, So it's kind of sad and that's why I'm doing this. I want to enhance the positive side of the gun culture um, I might make a comment here is that one of the people uh, well, several of the countries uh, had, during Second World War, had uh, uh, soldiers that they wanted to, to help come in their country to help protect them and things like this. And they always wanted the American soldier because the American shoulder, soldier uh, grew up firing weapons and were better shots and therefore could be better for protection for, for their countries. And as you see, we're, we're kind of the policemen for the world. Yeah, we can definitely see that these days. Um, 
What do you think about the assault weapons ban being grandfathered out here? Uh, I believe it's mid-September. Uh, the assault weapons ban is not necessary. For a uh, lot of uh, years, we've had uh, gun laws on the books that protected uh, the American public from somebody who wanted to use uh, firearms uh, illegally. The the automatic weapons assault. A lot of the assault weapons that they classified as assault weapons were just uh, the kind you use for hunting and things. They just maybe had multiple. Uh, uh, clips for uh, handling multiple rounds. So uh, it's not really necessary. There were adequate laws on the books to begin with and uh, the whole idea is to keep the guns out of the hands of criminals, not keep the guns out of the hands of law-abiding citizens. Right. Okay. Uh, do you have any special interests outside the gun culture? Uh, obviously I can see some things here, beadwork and such. Well this is uh, just a hobby for me. It has been for over 23 years and um, I retired from the Forest Service, retired from the Army Reserve and I have a lot of interest in artwork, uh, historical things. We have, uh, uh, I have a lot of Indian and Old West artifacts and uh, they're a lot of fun and that uh, collecting firearms leads you on to the other historical uh, parts uh, that link up with the guns. So if you have a gun that's 150 years old, you're also interested in the other items that are 150 years old that people were using at the same time. So big history buff too. Very good. Uh, let's see. Could you share any stories about firearms saving lives that you might know of? I don't know of anything personally that uh, people have, have done it, but there's a lot of stories that come out you have the National Rifle Association puts out several magazines every month mm -hmm. and they continually have stories in there about firearms used by law-abiding citizens saving lives. And uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of stories if you go back and look that uh, will relate to events that where somebody, you have a, an older woman living by herself and somebody breaks in and she manages to use a firearm to save her life. Uh, that's what we want, and we want to be able to have the, the law-abiding citizens have the right to defend themselves if they need it for that reason, and also use the weapons for hunting or marksmanship or other hobbies. Yeah, and I've seen uh, lots of those stories. I've read a lot of those NRA magazines and such, and I don't think I've ever seen any of those stories on the major media sources. It's kind of a sad thing that they only concentrate on the negative aspects. There's so many positive things out there that we should concentrate on. Uh, do you have any final comments for the uh, viewers of MCAT? Well, the only thing is to uh, make sure that uh, people who uh, view the media broadcasts look at them with a careful eye to see what's correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see some of the politicians that are even now running for office that uh, if you look in, the, in their past, they uh, have voted for uh, the American public to not have the right to uh, have their constitutional Second Amendment rights to own firearms. And uh, you got to get past the media blitz and, and go back and look at the facts. And uh, those people uh, have a hidden agenda which uh, we don't want to see uh, reported on the American public. Uh, the media serves a very good purpose. It's a very entertaining and everything else, but it can be biased, and so everybody should look at it with a, a careful eye to make sure they're getting a true story. And that's why I'm here, trying to balance out that bias, um, push it on to the other side a little bit. And uh, I appreciate your time, Mr. Lovejoy. And, uh, LaJoy. LaJoy. Yeah. And uh, I hope you had a good time at the gun show, as I did. And uh, we'll go ahead and see if we can interview some more people. Thanks okay. again. Well, thank you. Yes.
We're going to do a little interview here with Mike Fellows. And uh, what are you running for again, Mike? A Libertarian running for the U.S. House uh, in Montana, District 1. Great. Uh, sounds like a good... Uh, you said for Libertarian? Yes, Libertarians always believe that uh, people should have the right to do what they please as long as they don't infringe on the rights of others to do as they please. Sounds like a basic constitutional thing. I think everyone should be for that. Um, hey, Mike, uh, what do you think is positive about today's gun culture? And I think uh, actually being here the whole weekend, uh, a lot of camaraderie, uh, people use guns for various things and we, and we need to, to, to have guns uh, to simply to, to protect ourselves, uh, to enjoy it uh, for entertainment purposes. And I think that's pretty positive. No doubt. Um, what do you think about the uh, assault weapons ban being grandfathered out here coming up, I think, September? Well, 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 I, would, well I would support the elimination of the assault weapons ban. Uh, uh, that support elimination of things like the Brady Bill, and we've seen in such cases where somebody wants to get get a gun because he's worried for his life, and because the paperwork gets all screwed up, uh, he, he might be dead by the time he, he gets his firearm to protect himself. And I think uh, Congress should do the right thing and let the sunset provisions just lapse, and and we should get rid of all the unconstitutional gun control laws that we have in this country. Yeah, there's quite a few laws. It's hard not to, you know, do something wrong these days because they keep adding laws and they rarely take them away. That's correct. Right. Um, do you have any special interests outside the gun culture? Oh, I do work on cars and I, I, I do some videography and, and listen to music and those are a few of my hobbies that I do and enjoy them. And you still have a show on MCAT, don't you? Yeah, we still do two shows on MCAT. One's called Labor Vision, the other's called Other People's Pockets, you know, because we're constantly in this culture where you know, you got one person taking money out of one pocket and put it into another pocket and sometimes that's got to stop. We've got to keep the money ourselves and invest our own time and energy and do the things we want to do. Sounds like something to look for there on MCAT. Okay, do you have any uh, stories you'd like to share or that you rem remember about uh, firearms saving lives? Well, I can just point to one recently that happened uh, over the summer, a case in Great Falls where we had a, 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 convicted, con or a convicted felon got away from the halfway house uh, over there in Great Falls, um, entered a house, uh, and the owner came back and had a gun and uh, he felt he was uh, in fear for his family and, and his life, and so he had shot and killed a guy. And I think that's, that's what firearms are meant to do, to protect your property and protect your person and protect your life. Sometimes it's hard to do without a firearm, whether you're uh, maybe in a wheelchair or somewhat disabled somehow that you can't really jump up and do a lot of kung fu like I do, or uh, any kind of knife true, work or anything. So I think that is a very important thing for people to have, kind of yeah, bridges people, that gap. I think they should realize that you know guns are good to have, but you also, you also need to uh, learn how to use them because a, a federal government study that came out, I think it was either last year or two years ago, basically said that we could cut down a lot of the firearm deaths with kids. If you took your kids out, showed them how to use a fire gun like my dad did, mm -hmm. you know, what the dangers can be and how to use them safety. Uh, safety right. really works and, and, and you do need to go out and learn how to use them. Yeah, education is the key with just about everything and, and you'd be able to do it safely. Okay, um, do you have any final comments for the MCAT viewers? I just say I'm running for the U.S. House. And we'll look at our website at www.lp.org. Get our presidential candidate at uh, Badnarik, B-A-D-N-A-R-I-K.org. He's one guy that's not uh, going to vote for the semi-auto ban, nor would he vote for the Brady Bill, and he's pretty constitutional. And, and he does carry a gun, so I think uh, you got to look at those things and make some choices and vote come November. Fantastic. Take a stand and do what you believe in. I think that's very important for today's world. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Interview with the organizer here. Okay, okay, that's good. Uh, how do you say your last name, Hayes? Name it's Hayes Otto Pollock. Otto Pollock, very right. interesting. Okay, um, how, how did the gun show go? How do you th think everything went? It was very good this year. We, uh, this is the, the, one of the most extensively advertised shows in Northwest United States, and we had people here from 31 states in the union wow that's pretty so it was an excellent show fantastic um let's go on we're going to ask you the same questions we asked mike and uh, see what we come see what comes up uh what do you think is positive about today's gun culture i think that positive today i think we've been we're better off now than we were a few years ago uh uh people realize that firearms are needed for their personal defense but you know people are into weapons for any number of reasons you know they collect guns because uh, 
their old law enforcement guns, Civil War guns, frontier guns, hunting guns. They collect guns by makers, uh, mechanical designs of them, like side-by-side -side shotguns or single-shot rifles. And they want to get every caliber of a Colt single action or every combination of a drilling rifle or ca all the calibers of a Colt single action revolver. Or people are trying to get all the different models of a 45 automatic made or people are trying to collect and engraved examples of each type of a Winchester or a deluxe version or they want a cased coal a, just any combination of guns so you know people they have a just a very interesting there's so much you can learn from they they're interested in history and they're well read and they travel and they go into all museums and they look at things and it's just interesting yeah, just like collecting coins, you want to collect every specific type of coin and get the whole list of them, you know, so same thing with firearms and that, you know, and that shooting, type of thing. And in shooting firearms, it's just like, you know, having a, a Corvette and like can go out here, the engine running or having an old pocket watch and hearing it tick. Yeah. You like to have the gun, each type of, you know, a, a wheel lock or a flint lock or a a cartridge farm they are their actions work differently their ignition systems work different so it has a little different sound or year in it they're just kind of fun to see how they all work yeah and i once uh, saw a uh, movie a little short film about uh, how a guy did uh, uh guns he, he used a, like a little 22 rifle to actually draw the president's face and make art that way to actually right. make scenes and well that and was a Annie and Oakley stuff. and Buffalo Bill yeah they had they target shooters they would uh, shoot out Indian had designs and cowboy right. had designs with the designs of cutting the bullets through the tin when they were shooting exactly right yeah yeah that was pretty neat and uh, there's also this thing uh, about uh, the gun noise you were talking about right. how you could get different types of uh, guns Sound and make different types of rhythms and actually right. make music right. out of uh, using your firearms. A few years ago, about five or six years ago, they did a big huge film about some musical and they shipped about, they shipped hundreds and hundreds of old muzzle-loading Civil War cannons oh, wow. out of the United States to over into the area of Waterloo, Belgium to do some filming about wow. the, the sounds and how they, they took the different lengths of cannon barrel and powder charges to make a musical percussion sound of the sound of the guns going off so yeah. a lot of interesting things with firearms yeah no doubt um let's see what do you think about the uh, uh grandfathering out of the assault weapons ban well i hope that that does grandfather out they've shown over the last 10 years that you know criminals criminals don't go out and uh buy thousand you know multi-thousand dollar expensive semi-automatic rifles to commit crimes with they just get anything they can steal, which was illegal to do 10 years ago and still illegal to do today. All it is is a hindrance to law-abiding citizens. Uh, everybody in the law enforcement field and nearly everybody that's involved in this knows it hasn't done anything. It's just been a hindrance to law-abiding citizens. You should. They said that 10 years ago, if it worked, they'd keep in it. But it didn't work, it'd grandfather out. And it should grandfather out. It's of just a hindrance to law-abiding citizens of our country. That makes perfect sense. Uh, do you have any special interests outside the gun culture? I, uh, yeah, you know, I like, uh, you know, uh, uh, automobiles, and you know, uh, uh, you know, I like. Uh, military history and traveling and uh you know the culture of foreign people like maybe china or egypt or things so yeah I, you know the study of american indians and stuff although i have to admit that i'm uh, kind of highly motivated and interested in what i do and i don't find that there's anything wrong of a person being uh aggressive and having a uh single kinds of interest right uh the only reason I had that question was just to show the people that there's uh, well-rounded people out there. We're not just gun nuts. You know, we actually have a whole life. Of course, life, my, you know, you know sometimes, sometimes, you know, wives like to ask us, you know, when do we, when do we quit becoming buffs and become nuts? Sometimes <laughs> it's hard for us to decide. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. Could you share any stories about firearms saving lives? I think that firearms save a lot of lives in this country, and some 
sometimes we hear the grisly stuff when I think that, you know, every day in people's lives, you know, it makes them, our forefathers gave us the Second Amendment, not for hunting or fishing, they gave us a right to, for self-protection in our life. And I think there's a lot of people driving down some lonely road in the far stretches of our nation at night traveling, makes them feel comfortable to know that they've got a, you know, uh, God created man, Sam Colt created a cult to make them equal. And it makes you feel pretty good to have a, you know, to have a piece underneath your seat so that if you do have a problem, you'll feel a little bit safer. And I think it's a good thing. I mean, people that, people that don't have firearms don't have their freedom. And all we have to do is quickly look across to like the country of China that's got a billion and a half people and they don't have individual freedom of speech, they don't have the right to vote for who they want, uh, they don't have liberty. Countries that don't have free farms don't have freedom and that's the most important thing our forefathers read. Just our, our culture and our human beings on the earth go back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. It was just a little short skimp hop and jump of time that 200 years ago the men wrote our constitution. They knew everything about what we had faced in human mankind before, and they had read everything that had ever been written up to 200 years ago, and they said, hey, to have freedom of press and freedom of speech, you got to have firearms. And Mao Zedong, the dictator of China said, power come out of end of gun barrel. Though so gun barrel, very important to have. <laughs> yeah. And every animal in the forest has major claws and fangs and stuff, but, you know, I don't have very much in the way of claws or fangs, so I need something to equalize the pressure. That's true. So firearms really do help. Right. Um, do you have any final comments for the MCAT viewers? Well, you know, I, I, just, uh, I just like to tell you that, you know, that if you see things that are related to firearms shooting around uh, western Montana or, or stuff, or you got any questions, you know, chase down a gun collector or shooter or hunter target guy you know go to the gun club meetings uh, go to the gun shops uh, you know you'll find out we're uh, we're just uh we're the mill workers at frenchtown montana we're uh people in the business community we're students at the university we're young high school kids looking to take our first 22 rifle and go for a walk in the woods to hunt down a chipmunk i mean or to join a, a target club to shoot, go to the skeet club, the trap club. You know, we come in every size and shape, uh, every gender, male to female. Uh, you know, young people are interested, old people are interested. It's, it, they're interesting. They're, you know, uh, there's guns that are the most highly embellished artwork in the world. There's guns that are plain and common. There's expensive farms, there's inexpensive farms. There's cased farms, there's uncased farms. I mean, they come every different way in the world. They're very enjoyable. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for taking the time okay. out of your day, Hayes. Okay, and, uh, and thank you for your interview you in and future. talk to you down the road. All right, sounds hey, good. Thank you. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Kill the melon. Killed something. <laughs> Melon is dead! Melon down! Melon down! <laughs> Let's go inspect the melon. <sighs> Biodegradable, no harm to the environment. <laughs> Melon head is dead. <laughs> Woo! Dead melon. Got him! Woo! <laughs> Give me another shot. We're gonna finish it off now.
Do a close up? Yeah. Now that melon feels no pain. It's Woo. nasty. And we're gonna shoot a few uh, orange clay targets out there in the field. Let's go straight ahead to the far one first. Zooming in, zooming in. Okay. And it is dead. Ooh. Got it. You know, you gotta find your target each time. So they have rings that allow you to see the iron sights underneath. So I think that's what I'm gonna have to get for this so I can access both sights or, you know, Mostly under stress conditions though, you're not going to try for your sights. The scope is only for long distance mainly and uh, when you have enough time to relax and center on your target. And I got to get a bipod for it so that really helps set you up. Otherwise it's just going to be in tight like this. Like so. You know, without even realizing you have sights, basically. That's the combat style. It's just peppering without even knowing. Is it? Okay, never point anything you don't want to destroy. I don't care if I destroy the ground right now. Um, all guns are always loaded. Um, you know, it is loaded. And that way, I if, if I do accidentally point at something... Uh, that I don't, that I don't want to destroy. Um, I'll know it's loaded. And if that happens, like in the military, law enforcement, special forces type, they never put their finger on the trigger unless they're ready to shoot. Because a lot of them cross each other front and back, but they're professionals. They do this all the time. And even though they may be pointing at each other's backs, their finger's not on the trigger until they're ready to shoot. They're ready. To, they're aiming at their target, and they're ready to. To fire and stop that aggression that's coming at them okay so if you keep those three basic rules in to effect and another one would be to say uh, never pull your weapon unless you're ready to use it never brandish your weapon and say a halt and then be shaken and like please don't come any closer as they come closer to you and please stop you know never fake it if you're going to pull a weapon out of its holster, like the samurai always, say, samurai always said, never pull a sword unless you're going to use it. So whenever they pulled their sword out to show anybody, they would pull it like part of the way out. You would look at the temper of the blade and you would go, oh, that's pretty cool. And then you put it back. You wouldn't pull it all the way out unless you were going to draw blood. So that gave you kind of the serious mindset, the serious nature of, of a weapon. So when they pulled the sword fully out, they meant to either cleave somebody to save their lives or the lives of others around them, or if for some reason they pulled it out, they would end up cutting themselves and drawing blood. That would gear inside of them the, the very serious nature of that object. Okay, And the sword was the soul of the samurai, they would say. So it was a, a very, very important object for them because of its overall tool value of survival and life saving. So just like you don't unsheathe your sword unless you're going to strike with it, you don't unsheathe your gun unless you're going to fire. Or in this case, you know, I'm going to be shooting at targets. I'm not saving my life, although I'm getting skills to save my life. But uh, basically the idea is that when you pull your weapon out, you're going to use it. And don't don't hedge your bet. Don't kind of, well, maybe, sort of. No, when you pull it out, you're ready to use it. I'm downrange. I've got a good backdrop here to where uh, it's not going to fly over the hill and hit a house on the other side that I wasn't aware of or anything. I'm going to shoot directly into that hill. I will destroy anything on that hill, and that should be fine and safe. Okay. You dress your target usually at a side angle. You wouldn't want to go, hey buddy, because this is a very bad angle because you can be pushed onto your heels and fall on your butt really easily. And see how I step back to, to maintain my balance? Well, why not start in that position? And this is presents a bigger target, you know, 
if I'm a policeman and I have my bolt-proof vest on, sometimes they teach uh, this position, the isosceles, because it's quick and easy to learn, and they have the bolt-proof vest on, so they want the bad guy to take the shot at the chest area to where they can protect against it, and, uh, you know, they're not worried about getting shot so much. Whereas here in this position, it's more of uh, your natural defensive position. If you don't wear a vest especially, um, it presents less of a target. You're fatter this way, you're slimmer when you're this way, just like a fencer, that type of thing. And uh, you got your bone structure here to protect your heart and throat area and the major center line targets of your body. Your major organs and everything are right in this cavity. So this position right here, the weaver style position, prevents a smaller target, more stable position. It uh, mimics a rifle too. So you, if you go like this and shoot all the time and then you get a shotgun or rifle, you can't do this. You'll end up hitting yourself and breaking your sternum or something. So it doesn't cross train very well with the isosceles position. Um, this one, however, you know, I got my rifle here. Well, what if I'm using my handgun? This represents the stock of the, uh, the rifle for my handgun. So it's the same, very similar type position that I can use, train with, and get good at. It takes a little bit of extra training than the isosceles, you know, like that. This is a little more natural, a little more unnatural, but more life-saving in a general purpose area okay so that's one we're going to primarily be using the other one you'd be using um, like one of uh, our uh, special forces uh, actually a, a special operative CIA type used to say is it's not hands gun it's handgun so a lot of times they meant to use we'll say my knife or something a flashlight in this hand or you got your keys you're opening the door with this hand and then using this hand to shoot with. So I can use my knife to get them out of the way and shoot, especially in close position. Or maybe I'm using my keys or something like that to get in the house or in the car. And you know, I'm trying to get into it and somebody attacks me, you know, boom, bang. I don't want to drop my keys. Sometimes you naturally hold on to things even though you maybe you should drop them. So you're going with that natural instinct to hold things as well as, well, boom, I've shot this guy. Now I just want to get the hell out of there. I don't want to go searching for my keys in the dark. So I've already got them in my hand. So I'll pop the, the door open, holster my weapon, and I'm ready to go in the car and get away or in the house and lock the door and call the police, whatever you have to do. But a lot of times this position is one of your better ones or this position, as long as you don't I'm going to put the gun away now, as long as you don't put the hand in front of the, the gun. Okay, you got to be aware of that factor. But like I said, you're, a lot of times you're going to have something in this other hand where you're going to have to use one hand on the gun. So a one-handed position, uh, a rear-handed, one-handed position, or, you know, the double-hand position is more firm and you can get more of a reliable, steadier aim. Okay, but... A lot of times in a conflict, stress level type of encounter, um, you're not going to have a lot of time to go, where is that front sat? Where is he? Oh, there it is. And boom. It's a lot of times, uh, like uh, John Farnham, the guy who taught my instructor, who taught me, um, a lot of times you're just going to basically push the gun out and aim in a general way with the barrel. You're not even going to use the front sight in most instances. But sure, it's good to train with the front sight and get on target and squeeze slow, you know, draw fast, shoot slow is a good mantra, good thing to say over and over and get your mental programming going. Um, but basically, you're not going to use the sights in the stress encounters. It's going to be here, and then if you got some extra time and there's no more, but this guy's still being a threat, then you'll take your time and shoot with the uh, front sight. Okay, so, and if you do shoot with the front sight, put the front sight in the middle of the target. If you got a big circle around his head there or his chest cavity, put the front sight in the middle of the target. And that's a good quick combat sight. Don't have to line up the rear and the front sights. That takes too long. 
Just punch straight out, front sight, middle of the target, and squeeze slow. Okay. Let's put her away again. Okay. So that's a few quick basic rules. I can extend this even further, um, and we will, especially with the semi-autos. But right now, I just wanted to put a little bit on tape just to show you a little bit of what you can do to save your life and the lives of those around you. Mainly, you want to think like uh, as a law-abiding citizen, not as a survivalist. Survival would mean something totally different. You would just shoot whenever and whatever you needed to do. Um, but for our law-abiding society, we have to go to the courts after you shoot somebody and stuff. You want to have your legal ducks in a row, which means you want to just stop to shoot their or, uh, stop to shoot their aggression. No, you want to shoot to stop their aggression. Okay. That's the way your mindset's got to be in this modern society so you don't get in legal trouble. You shot to stop their aggression. I didn't mean to kill him, Your Honor. I shot to stop his aggression. And that's a good mindset to have. That way you don't get in trouble. And you, you stay less of a criminal mindset and more of just a law-abiding citizen. People look at you in a better way than in that manner. Okay. So let's take a little bit of time here and we'll go ahead and shoot. Okay, we're going hot, we're going live. We got our ears on, we got eye protection, head protection, you know, we got the whole cover going. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and do some shooting. I wanna run through a basic draw stroke and we'll go ahead and do it. So, presentation position, hand on the belly and the gun. Main reason is, if I pull my gun and my hand's floating out here, and I haven't practiced at all, you'll end up shooting your fingers off or shooting in your hand. That ain't good. Don't want to go to the hospital having fun out in the woods shooting. So what you want to do is presentation position, hand on belly, clear your clothing, hand on gun. Then from there, you want to pull your weapon, still have it close to your hip, far away from the person you're shooting and then slide the fingers and on line with the other fingers. This way they're not in front of the barrel at all. Muzzle awareness at all times. Know where that muzzle is pointing. Okay, then from there you're going to punch straight out to the target. Your dominant eye, my right eye in this case, is going to go right for that front sight. At any time, once I pull it out of the holster and point it down range, I can shoot. If someone aggresses upon me faster than I thought, I can put my hand way above and out of the way of the barrel and shove them away and shoot from the rocker position. Rocking back. The knee spike will get them. You know, don't point your gun at your knee. Point it in this big hole right here. You got plenty of room. It does take a while to get used to. And I wouldn't say do this right off the bat. I would say do some practice shooting first. Get good at the basics. But uh, this would be your basic, uh, if someone came at you really quickly, shooting type uh, position. Ward off their attack and shoot safely without extending the gun to where they can dislodge it from your grip. Okay? So to review, we have presentation position. Hey, I don't want to fight. But they push it. So... Clear your clothing, grab the handle of the weapon, other hands on the belly, extract the weapon, point down range towards your target, slide the fingers together as you push out and punch out straight to your target and use your dominant eye and line up that front sight with the middle of the target. And you do that as fast as you can, you know, start slow with an empty gun or a plastic weapon so you don't mess up. And then once you get smooth with that, then you uh, go ahead and pull the trigger slowly. It should be a surprise to you, a surprise break as they call it. And that will keep the barrel from jumping as you pull. And then, uh, and then uh, after you're done shooting, don't just go back and put in your holster. What if there's other guys around you? So that's why you look left, look right. Keep your awareness about you. Um, when you uh, get in a stressful situation, you have tunnel vision. You only see about like this. Everything else around you becomes in black. You can you, you kind of pretty much go into a tunnel. So you want to break that tunnel out and start looking side to side. 
expanding your view. Your perception is everything. If you can't perceive the threat, you're dead. You must perceive to take action. So once you're done here, pop, pop. Then you look to the sides, maybe even behind you, and then back on the target just in case they got back up. Okay, and then from there, if you're safe, if they're down and their aggression has been stopped, then you come down, look again because your gun and your arms are kind of in your way. So there may be something coming up from underneath you didn't see. So bring these down. They can protect your lower region and, and various other things. And from there, maybe inspect your weapon. Tilt it side to side. Again, look side to side, make sure you're okay. Then belly, a uh, hand on the belly, holster the weapon. Uh, if you have, see a revolver has double action as its safety. If you had a semi-auto, sometimes those would have a safety. Some revolvers do have a safety, you gotta flick off. So, in that case, as soon as you extract it from the holster, you would flick the safety off because you're ready to fire at this point. Punch out, do your shooting, make sure everything's okay. Look back at your target, make sure everything's okay. Drop it down, inspect your weapon. And then from there, put the safety back on before you put it back in the holster. Then back out to your pre presentation position. So basically it'll look like this. Presentation position, belly, and grab the gun. Take it out, safety off if you need to. Punch to the target, draw fast, shoot slow, pop up. Then from there, look around, make sure you're okay. Presentation position. I clear my clothing, the other hand's on the belly. I extract the weapon, safety's off. I'm online, I can shoot right now if I want to, like so. Oh, and I did, without even the sights. Nice, didn't expect that one. And then from there, say I've shot that once, then I bring my hands together, punch out, and shoot again. Now I'm looking around me for any more assailants. Look back at your target, he's down. So I take the finger off the trigger, come back down, look around, inspect my gun, make sure it's not malfunctioning. Then back in the holster, back to presentation position. I'm ready to shoot again. I did get a little flack off the steel targets, but that's why I'm really covered, okay? And you know, if you're in a real life shooting encounter, if they're shooting at you and they're hitting concrete and steel and glass, you're gonna get debris in your face. You might as well get used to it now where it's somewhat safe, okay? And don't go hee and smile either. You might break your teeth or something. Cover up. malfunction, dud rounds, whatever. So immediately, in the revolver instance, I'm gonna open the chamber with this hand, pushing, turn it over, align the hand with the barrel and the cylinder, pop it out, then from there, tilt it back, and get more rounds. In this case, I have my speed loader. I just hook it in this position. I'm aligning it here with the cylinder, okay? And from there, you just kind of let it go. It'll kind of sink right in for you. Spin the handle, and usually it just falls free. Close it, and then you should be ready to fire again. Look, back on target. You searched, made sure there's no malfunctions. Back in the holster. couple more but this time I'm gonna go with what you're gonna do in a real encounter don't worry if you miss the targets they're really small they're made to make you super accurate where in reality you've got about this much a body cavity I should have a plate about this size and maybe another one up above this size you know and they do make those 
But uh, right now, we're going to focus on that. You're going to do a double tap to the chest, and then that sets them up, usually opens them up, so you can do one to the forehead. Remember, you never shoot to wound. If you do, you'll end up getting hurt. If it's that bad that you got to pull your weapon in the first place to kill somebody, or excuse me, to stop their aggression, then you're going to usually do a quick center double tap, setting them up, and then you'll have a little bit more time to squeeze for the smaller head target. Okay? So let's go ahead and try this. Real simple, uh, basic one for your combat shooting. Double tap chest, then one to the head. A little bit further distance, but again, don't worry if you miss, just try your best. This is overkill with these small targets. Here we go. Usually when you have to do this, you want to drop your plane, because they may be shooting at you at this time. Hide behind a barrier, some type of concealment, get yourself some protection, and then try again. That time I went ahead and did an extra to make sure I finished it off. And we're done. Hope you enjoyed this. I thank uh, James Keating, my instructor, who learned uh, at the ESI Bodyguard Academy from John Farnham, the superior combat firearms technology. And uh, we'll do a lot more of this later. And then we'll probably do some Action Star events too as I get the handle on this. So, from uh, David Mobley and Luke, my cameraman, and Missoula, Montana, and the greater uh, nature around us, thank you very much. Do 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 do